I don't know if you recognize the song, If My People, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven, heal their land, amen? And that's a revival, a revival song, great song. If you have a Bible today, turn to John chapter 4, John chapter 4. This is a great, great story in the scriptures, and it's about the woman at the well, and sometimes she becomes the main character, or the main emphasis in the story, but really that's not all there is to the story. The Bible is such an amazing book, and um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, so he is the truth. And John, the Bible says, thy word is truth. We're also told that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free or make you free. And everywhere that Jesus went, he was always telling the truth, amen, because that's what people need to hear. Truth about salvation, truth about who God is, truth about how to live your life, what's good, what's evil. And so John chapter 4, we're going to read a number of verses. We won't read the whole chapter. And you may be familiar with the story, but... Anytime the Word of God comes forth, it's truth. And the Spirit of God breathes on those verses, on those very words. And God can speak to you a hundred different ways before we even pray and ask God to bless the message. So you follow along with me. We'll start in John chapter 4 and verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, about noon. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She she didn't understand what he was saying. There's a spiritual emphasis here, and it was a wonderful spiritual emphasis, and she finally figured it out. The Lord didn't give up on her. Amen? Aren't you glad he doesn't give up on you? (laughs) And he speaks again and again. But she just did not understand that. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Now that's a strange twist in the story. You see what they're talking about, this living water, and then he says, Go call your husband. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And so here we go with an argument about the place. Who's right about this, this background? Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit 
and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He's talking about the person is what's important, not the place. And sometimes we get all tied up in the place, but it's the person. We can worship God anywhere. Amen? Now we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We have fellowship one with another, we pray. But we can worship God 24 hours a day or every waking hour anyway. The Bible goes on and says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. What a revelation there. And upon this came the disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Why talkest with her? The woman then left her water pot and went, in, went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Now, here's something that they don't get. So we emphasize this woman, this, this Samaritan woman who doesn't know the Lord. She doesn't get a spiritual truth. Here's the disciples that have been with the Lord, walked with them, and now they're not getting the spiritual truth. It says in verse 33, Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Man, did somebody bring something for him? And I mean, you know, what, what happened here? Look at verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So, here's the truth again. Okay, you don't understand it. Here's the question, Lord, I, what's going on here? And the Lord always wants to answer that and show us what the truth is. Then it says, uh, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already under the harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Jesus said to his disciples, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are white already unto harvest. What was he talking about? All these men of the city are coming out to see who this person is that this woman talked to that her life changed. Amen? And so there was sowing of the word and now reaping of the word. And it's just a tremendous story. But the emphasis today, I, I just want to show you. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Lord, what do you mean? It's the will of God. And so as we get into the scriptures today, there's all kinds of things we don't understand. Amen? And we'll see that as we go through the Bible. But the Lord always wants to give truth. Amen? Not public opinion. He wants to give truth. And when he gives that truth, if we're spiritually minded, we can receive that. That'll be good ground. The word is the seed. And if it's planted on good ground, something wonderful happens. So we'll see what the Lord does. Amen? Be an exciting day. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. We're... We're like little children, and we come before you now. We want you to speak to us, teach us, help us, lead us. God, just bless the preaching and the hearing of your word for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Every word in the Bible is important. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture of something. 
we talk about the meat of the matter. We are talking about the most important, basic, root, crux, heart and soul. The meat of the matter. Uh, when you talk about meat and potatoes, amen? That's the main course. It's not a wimpy little salad, amen? Meat and potatoes. Amen? Amen. One amen. Okay. Uh, John chapter 4 and verse 32, again it says, He said unto them, He's speaking to his disciples. They're coming back. They're critical of why he's speaking to this woman of Samaria because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So all of a sudden, here's criticism that pops up. They were doing an honorable thing by going to town and getting meat for their master, so they thought. But when this conversation goes spiritual, they just don't understand it. In John 4, 34, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is do the will of the Father, him that sent me. So again, they don't understand it. He emphasizes that. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Strong meat. The deep things of God. It says, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We talk about the meat of the word. And by, by having the word in our heart, by understanding it, we know what is good and we know what is evil. We're able to discern that because we're mature believers. Amen? That's what that verse is talking about. In Jeremiah 3.15, God said, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. My purpose is to feed the flock. I feed the lambs, amen, the new converts, and I'm to, supposed to feed the sheep, even the old grouchy ones, Amen. It's a little joke here, you know, just liven up a little bit, amen. But it, I'm supposed to preach so there is an understanding of the word. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. 1 Timothy 4, 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, again, it's brethren, it's, it's disciples, it's followers of Christ. In remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attend, attained. Faithful men teach faithful men, and they teach faithful men. And it goes on and on and on. The word of God is explained, taught, preached, and the spirit of God enlightens us. In Luke chapter 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. And uh, he goes away, he wastes his inheritance with riotous living. He would eat Fain fill his belly with the husks that the pigs did eat, the hogs did eat. He said, I'm, I'm going back to my father's house. There's bread enough and to spare. And so he comes back. He's rehearsing this prayer. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell God, uh, tell my father I've sinned against heaven and against him. I'm no more worthy to be his son. Just make me as one of the hired servants. And he's rehearsing this prayer. It's, he went to a far country. That's a long journey back. I'm sure he had that prayer down pretty good. He comes and his dad runs out to meet him. And he starts into this prayer, or this confession, and before he says, make me one of thy hired servants, the father said, I love you, son. I forgive you. You know, we're going to have a great time. He puts a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, robe on him, right? But they killed the fatted calf. That was a special meal. It was meat. And that was a time of rejoicing. They didn't do that all the time, but they certainly did for that. It was a special occasion. In John chapter 4, the meat signifies the will of God. That's what the meat is. I must do the will of God. It says about Jesus, he must needs go through Samaria. That was the will of God. Well, what am I going through Samaria for? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's where I want you to be. And so he went through Samaria. In Hebrews chapter 5, the meat signifies the wisdom of God. And so that is the desire of the word of God, the wisdom of God, the deep things of God. Those that are of full age can handle that meat. In Luke chapter 15, the meat signifies the heart of God. It says in that chapter, that parable, that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And the emphasis is on that young man. And so you have joy, the joy. Um, take your Bibles and turn back to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. 
in 1 Kings chapter 18, you have the story of Elijah, and he's coming back to Ahab, and it's been a famine, no rain for three and a half years. Elijah comes back, and Ahab says to him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah said, No, you're the one troubling Israel. And so they have the big duel, you know, Let's call down fire from heaven. You have 450 prophets of Baal. Let's see what they can do. They couldn't call down fire from heaven. Elijah did. And the fire licked up the altar, licked up the water, licked up the stones and the sacrifice and everything. And then the people said, the Lord, he is the God. He is the God. It's not Baal. Because the question was, how long halt ye between two opinions? So the prophets of Baal were killed. You come to chapter 19. Elijah's going to kill, or I'm sorry, Jezebel wants to kill Elijah. So Elijah takes off. Amen? He's running. He just called fire down from heaven. They just destroyed 450 prophets of Baal, but Jezebel said, I, I'm going to kill him, and he takes off. And so he's under a juniper tree. He's asking God to take his life. Enough of this. I just can't handle it anymore. And we'll pick it up in verse 5. Uh, 1 Kings 19. As he lay, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days, 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, the second time he had meat. And that was meat and strength for the journey. So what do you have here? You have the will of God, the wisdom of God, the heart of God, the strength of God. Those are pretty important things, would you not say? But some don't have any idea what that meat is. What is the will of God? What is the wisdom? Where's the strength that I need to get through this? Where is that? God says, I have meat to eat that you know not of, but you can have that too because God wants us to have it, amen? And we mature and we get those deeper things of God. If you don't have it, do you desire to have it? Sweet will of God. Boy, do I desire to know the will of God. I pray about that every day. I just want to know the will of God, the strength of God. The trials come, the tribulations come, and we need the strength of God for that, don't we? We need wisdom so we can make the right decisions for the Lord. Amen? And we need a rejoicing because the joy of the Lord is our strength. What do we rejoice in? We can rejoice in God. We can rejoice that God speaks to us. We can rejoice that our names are written in heaven. I mean, there's a number of things we can rejoice in because if we don't have joy, boy, we're in trouble. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And sometimes we have sin-sick souls that just need a merry heart, and that helps us. So God wants us to know this. In our text in John chapter 4, Jesus is dealing as much with his disciples as he is dealing with this Samaritan woman. And I like that. Because wherever Jesus goes, it's not just the emphasis on this. When he works a miracle, somebody's watching that miracle. Amen? Remember he said to Philip, have I been so long time with you, Philip, and thou hast not known me? And so then he reveals more, and he reveals more. All we need. What's the song? All the fitness he requireth is for us to fill our need of him. And if we feel our need of God, God will meet that need. If we come to him like Solomon, I'm like a little child. I don't know how to go out and I don't know how to come in. God will give us wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. He upbraideth not. He's willing to do that for us. Amen? Guide my steps, Lord. That's all we need to say. Help, Lord. Amen? Because we are weak and he is strong. Jesus said something about spiritual water to the Samaritan woman, and she did not get it. She didn't understand it. And so he said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, if you knew that, you would have asked of him. It would have changed the whole dynamic. And so with the disciples, 
He said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Same principle. And these were the followers of Christ. We don't get everything. And it, it's humility that admits that. We don't understand everything. Uh, we can't see it all, but God does. And God wants to continually reveal the meat of the word, the truth. Amen? So he can guide us and so he can help us. In both cases, Jesus was talking about something that was satisfying this woman and satisfying his disciples, and so they didn't desire something deeper. I want to give you an example of that. Um, in Matthew chapter 20, we won't read the verses, but in verses 20 through 28, uh, there was a mother, and she came before the Lord, and two of her sons were disciples. And she said, Lord, would you grant that in your kingdom, my one son sits on your right hand and my other son sits on your left hand? That's a pretty big prayer request. And so the Lord says, you don't know what you're asking. You know, where, where did that come from? But you don't know what you're asking. And so he says, I can't do that. And then when the disciples, the other disciples heard it, now there's some contention. What do you mean? You two want to be more important than us? And so Jesus explained that he that is great among you let him be your minister, not pastor, minister. So we minister one to another. And the servant is better than his master. So he wants us all to be servants, amen? That was the truth he gave because somebody wanted something else that was more important. You go to Mark chapter 12, the same thing, verses 18 through 24. And it's talking about the Sadducees in verse 18. And it says the Sadducees, remember they were Sadducees? because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So in that verse it says, the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection came before the Lord and they're saying, okay, let's see, this, this uh, woman uh, was married to this man, he died and they don't have any seed, no children. So his brother's gonna marry her to raise up seed. Well, he dies and no children and then she marries seven times and all these husbands are dead somewhere the guy's got to say i'm not going to marry her amen she wants a life insurance but uh, but anyway so so he, they said when he dies or when she dies whose wife will she be in the resurrection now think about that they don't believe in the resurrection but they're asking the question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And it just, you know, well, we want an answer to this, and none of it made sense. They probably just wanted to catch him in his word. But I don't know that. It's just really, really strange. But here's the point. Because of their lack of understanding, they seek for something far less valuable. If the Lord is right there, and you could ask him anything you want, why would you say, if all these men died and she dies, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Who cares? Amen? Sometimes you get into arguments over a prophecy or you get into arguments over this. Some of that stuff is just unanswerable. Amen? And what's the main thing we need to hear from the Lord? The meat. Amen? True doctrine. The will of God, the wisdom of God, the strength of God, the joy of God. Amen? And sometimes we divide that for some other reason. There was a story about some scientific-minded guy, and he was down in the hills, and he found an old cabin, and he was, he was looking for something, and he knocked on the door, and he went in, and he noticed there was an old timer there, and he noticed that there was this big rock, looked like, holding the door open. And uh, he looked a little closer, and he saw it, the shiny parts of it. And he looked a little closer, and it was a rock about this size of gold. Gold. And he asked the owner, he says, what, what do you use that for? And he says, I just used it as a doorstop, you know? And here's a whole chunk of gold, and he's just using it for a doorstop. Listen, this is the most precious book in the world. Amen? Well, yeah, I got to carry something when I go to church, so I'll just carry that, you know. 
and then I'll just leave it on the bed stand until next week, and then I'll carry it to church so my neighbors see me taking a Bible. This is a gold mine. Amen? There is treasure in this. Search the scriptures. And it's not a doorstop. Amen? It's something so precious. And, and you find out what's on a person's heart by the questions they ask, right? And you find out what's on a person's heart by the answers they give to those questions. The will of God, the wisdom of God, the strength of God, the joy of God. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's just we don't know it. So all we have to say is, God, I don't know this. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, I've been a Christian 20 years, and I don't know how to, I don't, can't get this. I, tell him, amen? Tell him. That's, he's waiting to answer. Sometimes it takes a long time. You have in Luke chapter 9 and verse 55, James and John, the sons of thunder. Boy, they were great disciples. But here's, they go to a town and they don't receive the Lord, so they say, Lord, call down fire from heaven like Elijah did. It's a Bible example, amen? I mean, they did it there. Call down fire from heaven and destroy him. And Jesus said, ye know not. Ye know not what spirit ye are of. The Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save men's lives. Here it is again. Here's teaching. These are faithful men. They want to do what the Bible says, but they got it messed up. So Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. John 1, 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. I am just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. I am not the Lord. He is the Lord. That's the Lamb of God. And so we point to him all the time. John 4, 24. Ye know not what ye worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And to worship God, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's collective worship, but that's personal worship. That's driving down the road, singing to the Lord. You can make up the words to the song. That's in your prayer closet, not a literal closet. Amen? Not enough room, probably. But uh, shut, shut a door and get behind a door just for yourself and worship God. You lift your hands, pray, kneel, whatever, cry, laugh, but worship the Lord. He said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And again, we cannot be critical of the disciples. I think it was honorable. They went to get meat. They wanted to supply the need for their master, but there's something a lot more important. And this statement, what looks logical to us and makes sense to us, what promises satisfaction to us, is not always the will of God or how God is going to do something. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. Well, I don't know if that's a path. He does. He does. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. Hebrews 5. Peace. John 4. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Luke 15. All of the stories in the Bible are going to reflect some of that. It's going to reflect God's strength, His providence, His power, how you can have joy, how you can have rest in your soul. Over and over, He gives truth. And if the whole book is truth, turn wherever you want. Read whatever story you want. God will speak. There is a deeper satisfaction. As cool water satisfies the thirst, as meat satisfies the hunger, there is something that satisfies the spirit. And that's what the Lord wants us to have. And sometimes we're focused too much on the material and not much on the physical or the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Meat to eat that you know not of. Don't, they don't understand the spiritual message. You have in John chapter 14, verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive 
because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. So we can receive it because we know him. For he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. That's it. If you're saved, amen, then the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and this book becomes alive. Unto you which believe he is precious. If you don't believe, it's not precious. But if you believe, it is precious. So you just look at your heart. Is, is God precious to me? Is salvation precious? Is the Bible precious? It is if the Spirit is there. Amen? Because the Spirit loves that. You have John, 1 John 2, 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is in the truth. So the truth will set you free. Amen? Keep reading the truth so you don't get off on the wrong, the wrong path. If we know the truth, why do we not value the truth? And then we come to the age-old battle of flesh and spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Where the works of the flesh are these, and the works of the spirit are, are not the works, but the fruit of the spirit are these. And the works of the flesh, it's a terrible list. But if you walk in the flesh, you'll not fulfill the spirit. But if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the flesh. So we have two paths that go down. And what's the filling of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Amen? That's a good thing. So what do you know? It's a personal thing. You don't have to stand up and tell everybody, I don't get it or I know this or know that. But what do you know? Think about that in your mind. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are they called according to his purpose. Okay, I know that. I know that. We know 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. We know that. That's what the Bible teaches us. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So we know these things. Here they are, these three things alone, just these three things. The providence, the promise, the power of God, that will feed your soul. That will feed that hunger. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because they shall be filled. All we have to do, like the heart panteth after the water brooks, the deer panteth after the water brooks, so my, my soul pants after thee, O God. And if that's the case, he'll fill it. He'll fill the, he'll give you a drink of water that is not a normal drink of water. It'll be refreshing. Amen? Good news from a far country. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing. Amen. But the flesh is weak. So you've got to watch and pray. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, you find out about the last days, all of these things are going to happen. Um, but one thing it says, it's a very important thing, and Richard's thinking about it right now, so he can tell me what it is because the verse has left my mind. Um, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. How can that be? How can that be? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Matthew Henry said, God is to be loved above all, but a carnal mind full of enmity against him prefers anything before him, especially carnal pleasure. Take a newborn baby, and the Bible talks about that. 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. All you need is a desire. Amen? And then it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That baby is hungry for that milk. So when it receives the milk, the milk does the work. Amen? And so here's the milk of the word and you just desire it and read it and it begins to work in you. That's what God does. Hebrews 5, 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. The time is past. Amen. 
you've been through school and college, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. There can be a time when you've learned and you've lived and you've believed, but then your faith gets weak. And maybe you need to just get back to the milk of the word. Amen? Uh, I know as a pastor, I'm studying all the time. I'm reading this, I'm reading that, I'm answering these questions. These are deep things. But I need the simple truths of God in my life. Amen? I need that that's easily digestible. And so the things that can be a blessing to me. Hebrews 5.14 Strong meat belongeth to them who are full age even those who by reason of use, so doers of the word, not hearers only. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, they shall be filled. Spurgeon writes about John chapter 4, they could not enjoy spiritual meat to the full because they were so little spiritual. They weren't spiritual so they could enjoy the meat. They were growing. The Lord had patience with them. The Lord was long-suffering. But you, it doesn't matter the position. It doesn't matter the time. It matters what the Lord has done in our hearts. Psalm 107, verse 9. He satisfieth the longing soul. The longing soul. And filleth the hungry soul with goodness. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Develop an appetite for the word of God. And you'll develop an appetite for God. Because the book is alive and he will he will certainly bless Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit to be carnally minded is death to be spiritually minded is life and peace and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge Memorial Day Memorial Day young boy grows up uh, goes through school, you know, maybe there were wars in his childhood, but he didn't have to fight. He gets a little older, he gets a paper route, he pleases mom and dad, etc., etc. Then he's old enough, and he enlists, maybe in World War II. We saw something on Facebook yesterday or the day before, and they did a, something, com it's computerized, where they showed 8,000 bodies dead on the beach of our men. 8,000 bodies in an invasion, D-Day. And you look at that and you see all of these people, all of these men got all of those landing crafts and went forward to fight the enemy. Almost certain death, you know, especially if you were in the first wave, second wave, third wave. And it really, I try and think of what they were thinking of. You know, I've seen movies, I've seen war movies, and they try and make it as real as possible, and they're, they're in these landing craft, and they're coming to the beach, and pretty soon, some of them didn't even make it to the beach. And you think about that. You think about Memorial Day. And here we are, man, I mean, we drove in today, we're going to have a nice meal, we have freedom in our country, we're having a blessing just to be in church. Amen. I read this. Why would a soldier give his life? Why? Why did somebody enlist to do that? The draft came and you, you had to. But why would somebody enlist? A soldier faces death and is willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for their country, their cause. He gives up his comforts to preserve freedom for those generations to follow as well as those facing the tyranny and bondage of the enemy today. Freedom. It's a precious thing for the children, for the next generation, as well as this generation. David, when no one else would fight the giant, said, is there not a cause? And he went out and fought the giant in the name of the Lord. In Revelation 12:11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We're just going to serve God. We're going to be a good testimony. We're going to fight the good fight of faith. 
The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. He certainly didn't mean physically, because there wasn't a physical resurrection, but he died to himself, and he was willing to give his life. He said, it'd be better for me to die and to be with the Lord, but it's more needful for me to do this. And you think about the dedication and the sacrifice that somebody makes for a physical freedom, for maybe another 30 years of life or 40, 50 years of life. But think about what we're doing as Christians and what God would desire from us. There is a cause. Amen? There is a cause. And the results of our battle are far more important than the results of those battles. Eternal life rather than physical life. We read this in a devotional that we have today. Christ is all that matters. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Christ liveth in me. If we can live in Christ and have his life in us, shall not the spiritual balance and proportion which were his become ours too? If Christ is in us, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. If he were really our master and our savior, could it be that we should get so eager and excited over little things? If we were his, could we possibly be wretched, wrenched over the losing of a little money which we did not need or be exalted at the sound of a little praise which we know that we only half deserve? and that the praisers only half in ten. Now here's the illustration. Polycarp of Smyrna, a beloved friend of the Apostle John, was brought as an old man before the Roman governor. I will banish you, said the governor. I will take o uh, The old saint replied, you cannot do that, for I am at home wherever Christ is. I will take away your property, said the governor, but I have none. And if I had and you took it away, I should still be rich because I have Christ. I will take away your good name, threatened the governor. That's already gone, said the undisturbed saint. For I have long since reckoned it is a great joy to be counted the offscouring of all things for Christ's sake. Then I will put you in prison, growled the governor. You may do as you please, but I will always be free. For where Christ is, there is perfect liberty. Then I will take away your life. And then he said, then I shall be in heaven, which is the truest life. Do you know the meat of the will of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the joy of God? If you know that meat, it produces something. Amen? Amen. It produces something. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, we give our lives to you today. We give our will to you today. All that we are, all that we have, we put in your hands. May it be so. May the church rise up. May we fight the good fight of faith. May we all, all be involved in this great work. May we be faithful to it. May you use this work here. May you use this church to reach many souls, to reach our neighbors, to reach this little city where the church is and the surrounding areas. God, may you breathe on us and use us for your glory so that we could have the mind of Christ, so that we could know that meat, that deep, deep ministry. For your glory, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.